Okay, today I'm going to interview uh, Professor Mick Cooper, uh, who is Professor of Counselling at the University of Strathclyde. And we're going to do two interviews. The first one is uh, based on his experience in existential psychotherapy. So I'll kick off with a question, basically, to ask you how you came to be interested and involved in existential therapy. Well, I initially trained on a uh, person-centred uh, certificate, and uh, I really liked that, but I found it just a little bit too unstructured for me. Just a bit too much talking about when we were going to have tea breaks and uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. and negotiating over the process. So I wanted to do something a bit more structured and thought about doing gestalt therapy. I was going to do gestalt therapy for a while. And then I just came across a course at Existential Therapy at Regents College, and it looked interesting. And uh, I thought I would do that, and kind of, got into it as, as, as I was doing it. Had you read any existentialist philosophy before? Though? Yeah, I kind of read, I'd read some Sartre, I think it was all, and loved it. But I didn't really kind of identify with it, I didn't really think about myself as an existentialist. It just, I, I quite I quite liked it, I thought it was interesting. And um, and uh, was was quite interested in finding out more. I think I was a bit, I, maybe actually, to be honest, I think I was probably more interested in Gestalt at the time. And um, and like the kind of more dynamic and more kind of you know kind of very interactive approaches, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, it just the course wasn't quite right and things, and so I thought I'd try existential. Okay, all right, that's interesting. Um, and as I understand it, uh, then you, please correct me if I'm wrong here. Existential philosophy suggests that human beings are fundamentally and essentially anxious about death, um, the fear of nothing. Yeah. Now, how does a therapist of any persuasion work with that? Is there anything that can be done to alleviate it? It's always seemed a mystery to me. Yeah. I think, I mean, existential therapy is a really broad scope. So there's lots of different there's lots of different ways people would answer that question. And it probably makes more sense. I mean, existential therapists would generally say that we're anxious in general, you know, and that that's unavoidable and death is just one of the things that we're anxious about. I think what most of the existential therapists would agree on is that Anxiety, by definition, is just a given. That to be human is to be experience anxiety about the world because you know we're in connection with the world and there's things that we want and fears that we won't get what we want and understandably we're anxious and 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 you know if we're living a passionate, vibrant life that we re that really means something to us, then we're going to be anxious and worried or, or, or sad about it coming to an end. Um, as one of the other things as well as being kind of sad about maybe not being able to make the most of it because of our circumstances and there's lots of things that we're likely to feel anxious about. So I think what existential therapists tend to say is that yeah we're going to feel anxious about things um, and but what often happens is we end up feeling bad about feeling anxious. So it's not like the kind of prime, the problem actually isn't the primary anxiety of that we're going to die or that we're not going to fulfill ourselves in our lives but that we feel anxious and then we feel guilty about feeling anxious or we uh, feel worried because we're anxious and because we live in a culture which says we shouldn't be feeling depressed or we shouldn't be feeling anxious. So, you know, it's the kind of secondary emotions that come from that and then we maybe try and protect ourselves by saying everything's going to be fine when actually we know that it isn't. So Yalom, for instance, writes about all these different ways we might deny the reality that we're going to die by believing somebody can rescue us or by... You know, for instance, being in a relationship in which we think somebody can, at some unconscious level, they would talk about, can save us from it. And actually that that then creates the problems rather than anxiety about death. So a lot of the emphasis on existential therapies tend to be about, you know, let's accept the fact that we are going to die. Let's accept the fact that our lives are never going to be quite as we'd like them to be. Uh, it's going to make us feel anxious, but that's okay. We can be anxious. You know, we don't have to be happy all the time. And uh, accepting that and living with that and being with that generally is a more constructive strategy than spending our lives trying to fight against that and, 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 and thinking and having some fantasy that we can overcome that. So how in practice does an existential therapist achieve that? Well, a lot of existential therapy is based around dialogue, like a lot of other therapies, like person-centred therapy. And, it, you know, there's no specific existential therapy techniques. It's not a kind of technique-based approach. It's more a kind of stance that you have a dialogue with somebody. So for instance, if you were talking with somebody about death, you know, you wouldn't say, well, look, you're gonna die, that's it, tough. You know, you wouldn't, it's not a particularly helpful or, technique. Or cheer up. 
Well, cheer up, yeah, cheer up. You're interested about it, cheer up. So what? Um, it just be about the way that you'd approach it. I mean, a lot of existential therapy, like person-centered therapy, is very reflective. It's very much about helping someone to explore and understand their world and how they experience their world and you know the different aspects of the world, their relationships, their emotions, their um, um, their hopes, their goals, their their fears. But for instance, if somebody was talking about you know death and talking about being worried about death, you were talking to me as a client and you were talking about being worried about death. I'd want to listen to that. I wouldn't be reassuring you. I probably, I mean, whereas other approaches like CBT might be more interested in looking at, um, you know, what are maybe the dysfunctional thoughts around death and you kind of overestimating the likelihood that you're going to die. I might be coming more from an angle of wanting just to hear that and wanting to um, maybe normalize that in a way in the sense of saying, you know, that, that I might respond by saying, yeah, no, I can see that that's really frightening to think about that. And what I hear you talking about is how that you, you know, you love your kids and you love your partner. And when you think about death, you think about all the things you're going to lose and you think about all the things they're going to lose. And, you know, I can really understand how that, 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 that's really frightening for you. So it'd be a sensibility and it would be about kind of, deepening and understanding it wouldn't be about bringing something in but it would be about kind of reflecting that and exploring that okay i'm interested that you use the term normalize and i I understand that and i can feel how comforting that would be um and you seem to be you at least in that example you gave you seem to be saying that you would use empathy effectively Mm -hmm. yeah which is a sort of an instrumental use of empathy nevertheless um but you you don't think that the that some kind of comfort would come just through the understanding of it, not necessarily through the saying we share this. Yeah, the I mean, it, it's 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 a shared yeah. Thing. I mean, I, I, maybe it's worth coming back on the instrument. I'm not sure whether instrument would be the right term for it. We can come back on that. Um, I wasn't being critical when I said <laughs> that. No, seriously, I wasn't. I was re- I was really saying that empathy. Because some therapists would yeah. say that the um, the experience of being understood is a healing yeah. thing, yeah, yeah. not necessarily the experience of, of of being understood yeah. and feeling that it's shared. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a, it's a really um, good point, and I don't agree with that. Right. I mean, we've done a lot of research around um, like student. Of, of, of ours, Joanna was doing research around um, the experience of cancer patients and what they found helpful in therapy uh, and, and there's other people that have done work around that and I think they found very clearly actually that the clients were saying a number of things were helpful. Certainly they talked about it helpful being um, understood mm-hmm. but really again and again and again normalising came out mm-hmm. as a really important aspect of the therapy. You know that they said that it was really helpful being understood, and it was also really helpful hearing that other people were struggling with those problems. I mean, I come, you know, maybe we want to talk about this. Come from a very pluralistic standpoint, which is about saying there's no one right thing for everybody, mm-hmm. and that different mm-hmm. parts need different things at different points in time. Mm-hmm. But I think looking at the evidence that people like you know Joanna have brought together, I'm, I feel quite strongly now that for some clients, having experiences normalised. I mean, it's not a great word because it kind of, it's not about saying, you know, it's not about saying to a client this is normal and maybe it's the wrong no, word sure. for it, but about saying to clients that, you know, sharing with clients that other people have yeah. experienced that, I think for some clients it's incredibly helpful. Yeah. And I think to say, you know, it's not helpful as a kind of blanket okay. statement, it really doesn't reflect what a lot of clients find useful. Sure. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I mean, in my own work, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, that often say to a client where you're afraid of death and you know well we're all afraid of death you know I mean because it clearly it can be very dismissive you know the client is talking about they're afraid of fear of death and I say well you know we're, we all fear dying then that's that, I, I think that's unlikely to be helpful but I think there is a way of saying you know I really you know I can really hear how you're afraid of death and I, I get a sense that you know for for a number of people coming to that point in life that can you know that is really as a way, I think, of deepening the understanding, not as a way of kind of, kind of dismissing it, but as a way of deepening a sense of understanding and empathy. Sure. I think that can be a useful thing. Okay. I, I certainly understand what you're saying, and, and I was... I mean, I think it, it does tease apart some of the different meanings and understandings of empathy in the sense that... It, 
some people might say that being understood is the therapeutic moment and other people might say uh, that having the aloneness that that um, in some way helps ameliorate the, the yeah. aloneness yeah. And, you, and there is another way that you can get to through empathy which is to say you're not alone because other people yeah. have a similar if not identical yeah. clearly not identical but other people are like you yeah. which is very which is different and that in that sense you, you're yeah. using the term normalizing to say that you sort of you're not the only one yeah but i think i think that's right but i also think to ask a question what is the therapeutic moment mm. is really the wrong question okay because i think to assume that it's going to be consistent Oh, I you know, which I'm sure you wouldn't, but I think, you know, too often in our field, we say, yes. you know, what is it that's therapeutic? Is it empathy? Is it yep. normalizing? And yep. I think all the evidence shows that it's just different for different clients okay. and that we need to be open to our particular clients and to mm -hmm. find out from them what is helpful. So I think in relation to existential therapy, I mean, I think for some clients, the stance of existential therapy of, you know, accepting death and accepting the anxiety is just not going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, actually some clients may be massively overestimating the, the likelihood of them dying or, you know, if you're working with someone with health anxiety, challenging their thinking, helping them to kind of think rationally and reflect on, you know, how they're kind of weighing things up or they've seen things in black and white terms is actually really what they might need. But I think for some other clients where... I think it's very helpful. I mean, in my experience, it's very helpful for clients who get worried about kind of getting anxious. And I think a lot of people do have this cycle of anxiety where they kind of get anxious about something. And then they feel that they shouldn't get anxious, that normal people don't get anxious, um, that there's something wrong with them for getting anxious, that it's, it's, it's a kind of impending sign of some kind of breakdown because they're getting anxious. And I think for those clients, having a stance which may be rather than challenging the anxiety, or saying, you know, well, let's look at why you feel anxious. Is saying, oh, I really understand that that's anxiety provoking. For those kind of clients in those kind of situations mm. can be, a, I think, a helpful way into mm. helping them explore and feel mm. better about themselves. Mm. Well, I think it's interesting that we're talking about empathy and anxiety. Um, because I, I have some questions prepared or some general areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, it might be interesting to move on to my next general area which is to to ask you about congruence and in particular the any relationship there might be between um, the idea, Sartre's idea of living in bad faith yeah. and how this might relate to Roger's notion of incongruence um, and when I think about that it seems as though we almost certainly would move away from the from the area of anxiety, but I'd be interested to hear what you what you. What do you to mean by moving that. away from there? Well, um, I can I can draw. I'm trying to put myself in the position of the viewer of the of the interview, and I can put and, and I can easily see the links between being understood, not feeling so alone, and being anxious. Uh -huh. And yet, when it comes to uh, living a life in accord with a set of yeah. central values or my true self or however people want to express it and and relating that to anxiety is a bit more of a tricky maneuver okay. it seems to me yeah so the question is well, about the question really is um about bad faith about bad faith oh, and yeah, incongruence anxiety. yeah i i, I think one of the things about the existential position on kind of bad faith and incongruence, where it differs, I think the existentialists tend to imply that that's also a bit of a given of existence, that we're always going to be in bad faith. Certainly Heidegger, when he talks about inauthenticity, is sometimes confused with incongruence. But, I mean, he's, when he talks about it, he really makes it clear that a lot of the time we're inauthentic. For, and for him, the moment of authenticity is actually the kind of more rare moment when we actually face up to the kind of nothingness and the, and the kind of meaninglessness of our existence. Mm -hmm. So not only does he see it as kind of moments, but he also sees it in more kind of, not negative, but more kind of traumatic. Maybe that's not the right word again, but you know, that, that, that moment of authenticity is actually a very challenging moment because it's facing up and seeing like the kind of 
the, 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 the theatre of the meaning of lives that we kind of construct, the idea that there is some meaning in our lives that kind of falls away and we see our lives for what it is, that we create our own meanings. So he uses it in quite a specific sense. Um, and there's very much an acknowledgement that, that we're not there all the time. So it's, it's, it's less, I think for the existentialist, it's kind of a less of an ideal that we should live in this thing called authenticity, right. or really that we ever can live, you know, in this in this truly authentic, congruent way, but that we will fall into times of inauthenticity. But at the same time, I mean, I do think in both of the approaches, both in the existential approach and in the person-centered and humanistic approaches, there is a real emphasis on trying and 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 being real and what it means to kind of be real and to be true to ourselves in our lives. I guess one of the other differences, you know, is that in the existential part, being real in our lives means being real to the givens and the limits and the kind of social context and the, the, the social limits that are there. I mean, Rogers talks less about that. Um, so again, it has a slightly more kind of negative connotation of what it means to be real. As you're talking, it's sorry to repeat. Yeah, go on. I, I think to summarise really, I think the difference is it's a less idealistic notion of what it means to be. I think in the person centred there's a kind of sense of, mm. you know, to be real mm. is a very positive mm. thing. And I think the existentialists would see it as positive, but not, you know, but also one that's full of anxiety and full of guilt and, you know, the, 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 and challenge the, to, to be real. And I don't think Rogers or other people in the person centred would, would deny that, but there is a bit more of a sense that if we can be real, then we can reach some kind of more fully functioning, some kind of higher level um, you know, some the, the good life, and certainly the existential view of the good life is, is, is different. I think from the person-centred view. Right. So, looking at the person-centred approach from a from an existential point of view, it might appear to be rather romantic and idealistic and and uh, and optimistic. Yeah, I think that's good. I think romantic, perhaps rather than optimistic. Right. I think it's seen yeah. as a bit romantic, to the point where. Um, it can be kind of unhelpful uh -huh. because people can get a bit caught up in a kind of fantasy uh -huh. about what their lives could be like. Uh -huh. And I think you can get to the point where people in the person, in the world in person, it's almost like everything will be okay around the corner. You know, it's, it's like if I can work on this and I can do that and I can be really authentic, then everything is going to be okay. Uh -huh. And I think the existential is a bit more actually, I'm kind of doing my best to, uh, now and that um, you know there isn't some kind of good life just for anyone. this is it you know this is it um, as it is um, you know this is this is as good as it's going to get and I guess that a person centred therapist would turn it round 180 degrees and say well the existentialists are run the risk of becoming trapped in yeah. a in a downward spiral of gloom and doom yeah yeah well that's certainly you know, how people imagine it <laughs> You know, yeah, certainly we know from the research that a bit of unreality is a good thing. I mean, yeah. it's good for your mental health. But I think, again, you know, from a pluralistic standpoint, these different ways of thinking suit different people. Uh -huh. And for a client, for instance, who tends to be kind of bubbly, tends to be positive, tends to be optimistic, working with a therapist who sees things in that way as well, is, is the research suggests is probably most likely going to be helpful. Someone a bit more like myself, who, who's a bit more kind of, you know, questioning and cynical and a bit more, you know, doesn't see things in such a positive sense, I'm not going to do well with a therapist who's kind of encouraging me to see the positive in everything. Mm. And I, so I think, again, it's a real individual differences. And we know that therapists that are aligned with the ways that clients see the world tend to be more helpful than ones who are, who are seeing the world in kind of different ways. So I think as an, existential, as an existentially informed person centered therapist, I work well with clients who have kind of similar worldview, I think. You know, kind of, not, not exactly the same, but I think I work well with clients who kind of question, who are, are, are kind of positive, but also have a kind of, you know, challenge things and don't want to see things in, in kind of completely positive terms, don't believe things can be seen in completely positive terms. Right, interesting. Interesting that you should talk about the notion that or at least try and formalise the idea that different types of clients will work better with yeah. different types of therapists. I mean, sometimes it's refreshing. I'm sure sometimes it's refreshing mm. to work with someone who sees things different ways, but the research generally shows, or is showing, that 
a therapist who's kind of aligned with your worldview, with your strengths, with your way of doing things. Like for instance, CBT is most effective for clients who are already quite cognitive in their processing. It's not that, you know, if you've got someone who likes to kind of think things through, then having a therapist who's very emotion focused, you might think, well, that will compensate for their problems. But actually, the evidence shows that having some a therapist who's also, you know, likes to think things through and think about what's the rational thing to do here seems to be most helpful. Therapy seems to help people build on their strengths and what they already do, rather than some kind of expert who comes in and, and, and transforms how the person... I'm sure right. it's not true in all cases, but generally mm. seems to be the case. Sure. I mean, it has a kind of common sense logic to it, and uh, interesting you should talk about Gestalt therapy um, early on there, because Fritz Perls said exactly the opposite, that you, that you need to choose the therapist that's going to challenge your defences. No. Uh, otherwise you're just going to reinforce them and get nowhere. I think the research kind of runs against mm, that these sure. days. Yeah. I think it kind of runs against that. I mean, it, partly because maybe the research tends to be on short-term therapies. And it may be if you work for a longer term with uh -huh. somebody who really sees things different ways. you can. But I think there's also kind of, I don't know, an arrogance there in, in us as therapists. I think thinking that our role is to kind of change and, you know, correct someone's kind of worldview. I mean, at the end of the day, things like worldview, life philosophies are personal subjective positions. Nobody's ever sure. been able to show that a CBT or a person centered or an existential one is a better one. And I think, you know, when you, again, coming back to pluralism, a lot of the pluralist the argument is, is that there are no ultimates in terms of these life philosophies, life positions. No, sure. You can never say which is the right one. And therefore you do need therapists who are able to support and, um, and help somebody feel good about their life position. And I mean, that, that, for me, that's where existential therapy is just so important. It's not about somebody's got a different philosophy coming in and being um, fed some kind of existential position about life being miserable and, and, and you know death being an anxious thing. But I think for, for, for people and for clients who do hold that, and I think it's a significant minority of people do tend to see the world in that way. I think having a therapist who, who, who can support that who doesn't pathologise that, you know, For if, if I'm working with a client who comes in and he's talking about how life feels really meaningless sometimes, I think to have a therapist who takes that seriously and doesn't start saying, well, I wonder what is going on there with your thinking or I wonder what the emotional process is, but actually say, yeah, yeah that's a good question. I think it's really important. Certainly that's what I'd want as a client okay. myself. So you've rather artfully wound in... Um unconditional positive regard as a you know really being valued and having you, your whole self your ideas however yeah. uh, um, cranky they might appear to other people to be and how glum or even how hopelessly optimistic it's a good thing yeah. to have you have to, to be validated yeah and that's where a lot I mean people like Ardy Lang you yeah. know that's where they really came from was really to try and stretch the boundaries of what it means to validate and accept people oh. and that even with people who are presenting with you know psychosis that rather than coming at that from a kind of pathologising perspective and asking what's wrong, is trying to validate and deeply respect the person and, and to say, you know, how is this meaningful and intelligible within that person's life context as a way of that person trying to survive and, and, and strive within their particular context. And for me, that's the real core of what it means to work in an existential or a person-centred or a pluralistic way. Okay. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, just a, a couple more minutes. Um, I, I, halfway through, you mentioned existentially informed person-centred therapy. The, and I know that you also mentioned being plural, having an interest yeah. in pluralism. And I wondered whether, at this stage in your career, you would say you were an existentially informed person-centred therapist or a person-centred. <laughs> Or pluralistically it. informed existential person. Well, it does person seem to me that, that you might be. Uh, I, this is a I, really saying to to challenge you. It sounds more like a person-centered, informed existential therapist. No, I, if I was going to between the two, I'd define it the other way around. Okay. I'd see. I'd. I, I would talk about myself as a kind of a therapist who works in a pluralistic way. And drawing mainly from existential, person-centered, relational, postmodern mm -hmm. ideas. I mean, that's how I'd understand okay. what I do. But if I had to kind of choose between the two, I'd say I'm, I'm more. I think my practice is pretty person-centered. Uh -huh. You know, it's very relational. It's around. You know, the emphasis is around empathy, understanding, acceptance. But for me, the existential ideas around. Uh, for me, are exactly as you say, really, a ways of deepening acceptance and deepening. Uh, 
uh, understanding and deepening and apprising of somebody. Mm. And I guess, you know, there's there's ways of working existentially which are kind of more didactic, which are more about um, holding a particular philosophy of life about how life should be lived and then helping the client to, you know, see that. And I think there's a lot of value. I mean, I've learned a lot. You know, if you look at work, something like Emmy Van Dersen, I've learned a lot from that, but it's really not how I work or how I could uh, subscribe to. I think it's great for some people, but right. it's too kind of okay. didactic, I think, for me. So some existential um, practice is more psychoeducational, almost uh, didactic, um, uh, argument, you know, but based on on discussion uh, and more sort of argumentative dialogue. In some yeah. way, there's some REBT people. But um, I think, and it, and it holds a particular philosophy. I mean, you look at yeah. work, something like Emmy I mean, it's fantastic her work, and I think you know I've learned personally a lot from it. But it is very much about how to live a full life. You need mm -hmm. to kind of face up to life and mm -hmm. meet the challenges mm -hmm. of life and not be too kind of you know not, not too feel sorry for yourself. And I guess it, that kind of sits, I guess, less well with a pluralistic perspective. Which is which is very much about you know different people need different things and there's there's really not one right way. But I think for um, some people, I think that life philosophy it, 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 you know is really important. Okay. But I would see myself as somewhere or, or the work of Frankel, which is again, which is about you know the real importance of meaning and finding meaning in life. And again, I kind of think that's useful for some people, but I wouldn't want to assume everybody finds that helpful. Okay. You've mentioned a, a, a few um, thinkers and writers there. Um, by way of closing, is there anything you would recommend that, that, that people, particularly, I guess that, that um, uh, most viewers of this will be person-centred or leaning towards person-centred and probably not very well versed in existentialist philosophy yeah. or existential therapy. Where, where would you say it suggests that they go? To I think, well, I think Emmy Van Dersen's existential counselling practice is probably, has always been like a kind of landmark book, I think, particularly in the UK, and it really presents a very clear model of what, to, what existential therapy is like, I think. Uh, I mean, my personal favourite is Ernesto Spinelli's Tales of Unknowing, which I just think is a fantastic book, mm. and which really gives some wonderful case studies mm. about what it means to practice in an existential way. Uh, Yalom's book, you know, for more reading, Yalom's book, Existential Psychotherapy, is just you know the kind of the definitive text really on the different ways of working with death and meaning and isolation and freedom. And really, kind of goes in that deal. Although it's very psychodynamic, I mean, a lot of Yellow's work has a very psychodynamic bent to it. Um, the books that I've done, the Existential Counseling Primer, is a very kind of straightforward introduction to different ways of working existential. Existential therapies, the book I did with Sage a number of years ago, kind of gives a more detailed outline of, of the different schools. So I'd probably, I'd probably start with some of those. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. It's been very interesting. It's been